You're listening to The Peach Pit. I'm here with none other than Nick Lee, the guitarist from the band Moontooth. Their new EP comes out July 31st. It's called Violent Grief Acoustic Selections. Nick, thank you so much for taking time to talk to me and welcome to The Pit. Hey, Derek. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. So what have you been listening to lately? Um, lately, I have been listening to... Um, I like that the new Imperial Triumphant. There's some crazy stuff on that new record that they put out. Um, new Primitive Man. I played a couple new songs out. I've been listening to that a lot. Um, Chelsea Wolfe's new band, Mrs. Piss, uh, is really sick. I probably the most the thing I've been listening to most the last few months is that new Run the Jewels album. I love driving to that record. Oh yeah. So you, uh, you got a bit of that hip hop in you too, then, eh? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I'd say like around 17, 18 years old, I started to, uh, open my mind more to that. The big record for me and for, uh, I know for Bray, our drummer, that was like sort of the, the entryway was like, uh, ready to die. Um, the Biggie, Biggie Smalls record. And then we just hearing how heavy it was, um, just production wise and his, his voice and delivery, you know, it's just like damn, this is, this is heavier than most metal records. And, uh, and then just kind of getting through all the, I was into Tribe Called Quest and, um, Wu Tang and Nas a little bit. And it's like run the jewels. I feel like has that great mix of awesome, heavy beats with like good lyrics and killer Mike in particular, like his delivery is just so, so awesome. You know, I could listen just to him forever. Now you got me all curious about like other, uh, well, I mean, people call them guilty pleasures, but I don't like to call them that. I call them shameless pleasures because it seems like nobody, nobody should be feeling guilty about what music they like. Right. So, uh, is there anything that would be less really unexpected that would just make fans go, what really you're into that? Um, I don't know. Maybe at this point, you know, it's like, uh, I think you can kind of hear this in the, in the record, but I'm really into like bluegrass. Um, I really like, uh, I've been listening to Tony Rice, and I like like the Flat Picker guys. You know, like um, I really love like Chet Atkins and the and the newer um, side of things. This, this guy Billy Strings. I've been really into his last couple records. Um, yeah, I've, I've been really into just finding new cool like bluegrass guitar players. You know, there's just so much to, um, to just as a guitar player, there's just so much cool playing and that stuff to chew on. Um, there's a really great and also kind of hilarious records by Chet Atkins and Les Paul called Chester and Lester. That's just, the music is amazing. And then there's just them like kind of goofing on each other in between songs. Um, yeah, I don't know if that, I don't really consider things guilty pleasures either, but I, I mean, I like, um, I just more just like old country, you know, I, I love, uh, Willie Nelson, um, redheaded stranger. I've been really into that record the last couple of years. Uh, you know, it's pretty crazy. I, I, for the people I've talked to so far, no one has yet mentioned Chet Atkins. And you're the first person to do that. And I think that's so crazy because, I mean, that guy was a, a beast on the instrument. He could play two songs at once. Yeah, that's that's a good way of putting it. I um, I don't remember exactly where it started. I mean, I I, uh, I definitely like appreciated guys like, like Johnny Cash growing up and some older country, but it wasn't really my thing. Um, and then just kind of, I don't know, there's a guy named, uh, Leo Kotke, who's like, um, instrumental, uh, acoustic guitar player, at least like in the beginning. And his, he just like shreds, you know, acoustic guitars in, in the sense of like flat picking and bluegrass finger picking. And, um, he, he's a little more experimental than some of the other guys. Like I got into John Fahey and then sort of just like brought me to Chet Atkins, which was like a name I always knew. Um, like I know my grandfather loved Chad Atkins, but, uh, yeah, like trying to learn some of his songs, him or like Jerry Reed, you know, guys like that, like they just, like you said, they're playing two songs at once. Like I, I find, I, I consider myself like a pretty decent finger picker, but the way that they can do the bass line and, and the melody line in such a separate way is just, it's very, um, it's very homegrown. It's very hard to, to replicate as someone who grew up, you know, learned, like, cutting my teeth on like Metallica and Slayer and Ozzy and stuff, you know, like learning those songs, it's a very different way to play the guitar. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of like as a musician trying to push myself, that's sort of 
where I've been uh, most interested in growing is being able to do stuff like he does. And the guitar was your first instrument, wasn't it? Yeah, I was. Um, I got my first guitar around six or seven, and then I started taking lessons at about eight years old. And so, yeah, I need to kind of know more of that origin story about how you got so, uh, how, how you basically discovered your passion for music, how you met Ray, and how you guys kind of... Uh, exemption, yeah. The uh, Yeah, so I was into music from an early age, my uh, my uncles, you know, or really my, like my family friend uncles, you know, they all played in cover bands. So, uh, they would be, I would be at their gigs from when I was a toddler, you know, pictures of, you know, me watching them play. So, um, and my, my parents don't, um, play instruments, but they you know, always had music on in the house. You know, my, my dad really more got me into Sabbath and Motorhead and, and Metallica. And my mom, um, you know, she was, she kind of grew up more like a deadhead and then she was in the eighties more into like new wave and stuff. So there was like a lot of different music, always, you know, always on in the house. The things that they would agree on would be like Allman Brothers or Stevie Ray Vaughan or, or even like ACDC. Um, and then, yeah, as a little kid, I think I heard Metallica around six or seven and then, um, asked for a guitar, you know, that was like the big, um, light bulb for me. It was like, Oh, this is, this is what I like. This is what I want to do, you know, this is going to be a part of my identity. Um, and then, you know, I was taking lessons and learning covers and just trying to get my cousins to, to play music with me and stuff, uh, until middle school, uh, and seventh grade, I met Ray and he was, you know, the first person I had met that was also into metal, you know, cause it wasn't really, you know, you're talking about 1999, 2000, 2001. So like everybody's into, you know, Backstreet Boys and NSYNC and stuff that are my, are my age. Uh, and, um, you know, so to meet someone my own age that was wearing a Metallica t-shirt was like, you know, a big moment, you know, and then I, you know, he said he played drums. I said I played guitar and we had, you know, a handful of other friends who we met at the same time who were also already passionate about playing music. So we've been playing music together ever since. And that's a strong, and bond you guys must have i mean going back all the time to when you were 13 you said yeah um yeah for sure it's um yeah the original band well the ori there was a couple like uh incarnations of it obviously when we were that young you know we just sort of got together and started playing covers and we were pretty much immediately like showing each other riffs and stuff and writing songs um by the time we were 15 we were playing in what we called exemption that was um uh, four piece in the beginning and then for the most of the uh the run of it it was me ray and a, a guy named tom moran on bass and vocals who is a killer singer songwriter and i encourage anybody listening to this to go check out tom moran um but uh yeah it started up like kind of just very metallica pantera influenced metal uh and hard rock and then we sort of just got weirder as um we got a little older uh the last record we put out in 2010 was called Public Cemetery Party, which you can still find on Bandcamp and on streaming services and stuff. And if you listen to that, you can sort of hear um, where we, you know, where our taste started to go. That became Moontooth afterwards. Um, uh, Tom wanted to pursue other styles of music, so we, we disbanded Exemption, and then me and Ray started Moontooth pretty much at that rehearsal that we <laughs> that we disbanded Exemption, started writing songs, and yeah, we just like you know. We, we kind of seek a lot of the same things out of out of music and writing songs, you know, like something that's palatable and memorable and, and catchy to us to an extent, but also that challenges us as musicians and challenges us to, like, come up with just wilder sounding riffs and, and parts that, you know, just keep us, you know, stoked on it, you know, and we, we just sort of both... Uh, really pursued music as a living. I mean, he owns a recording studio called Westfall Recording Company with his partner, Anthony, uh, which is here on Long Island, Farmingdale, New York. Uh, uh, so that's his job. And, you know, I've, uh, in addition to many stupid day jobs over the years, I've always taught guitar and played in other bands. Um, so, you know, just the, the passion and the kind of uh, mutual taste uh, that we have is you know, in our friendship, obviously, we're basically brothers, you know, and uh, has kept us, you know, able to have a functioning 
you know, in good relationship for uh, almost 20 years now. So when you guys come up to each other with ideas, or do you sometimes just immediately go like, ah, oh, that's like a, a this thing, or you're going after that, or like you, you kind of like see each other where you want to go? Yeah, uh, there's definitely um, like, uh, you know, we can musically finish each other's sentences is usually how I, I like I put it is sort of like right. if, you know, if I show him, if we're playing, if I'm playing guitar and he's playing drums in the room and I'm just showing him new stuff, um, you know, he'll, he'll kind of call, you know, he knows the way I write so well that he'll kind of call like a tail of a riff or something and have the perfect feel ready to go just cause he kind of, he knows my style and vice versa. So we kind of write to each other's strengths to a certain extent, but you know, Ray's also, um, a really killer guitar player. So he's written a lot of um, Moontooth material as well. So, you know, that ability to kind of um, both contribute, you know, in the musical aspect of things, it's just sort of, um, it's been like uh, the fun competition too. It's just sort of like, you know, it's healthy competition of, of just sort of like who can come up with the, the crazier thing or the or just the cooler riff, you know, and, and that's, because it's exciting with somebody you know, if he does it or if I do, it doesn't matter. You know, it's sort of just like, you know, uh, it's just important that, you know, the material is flowing and that we have new ideas and that hasn't been a problem really ever. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, just definitely like, we're just used to each other's styles, you know, I mean, in the beginning of Moontooth, it was like, you know, we just wanted to play as many gigs as possible in the first couple of years so that we could, um, have that same connection with John and Vin, you know, as it happened very quickly, but it was sort of just because we were constantly staying busy and constantly working because, you know, we and Ray had been playing together at that point for already, already almost 10 years, you know, so you have a chemistry that's, you can't just sort of, um, manufacture, you know, overnight. It, it takes years of working with each other and dealing with each other and, um, just sort of like, you know, connecting you know on a on a mental and uh, spiritual almost musical level well it is spiritual i mean it, yeah I, you almost feel like laughing to use the word but uh, like it is spiritual because it's, it's sort of like communicating on a higher level than language that we use right and it, it seems like you guys have that like from from when i listen back to the freaks ep everything up now to crux I mean, you guys have changed, you've evolved, you brought in new influences and tried new things and explored, but at the same time, you haven't gone away from the core, which I think the reason why that is, is because it's the four of you, you have such a strong connection. And even like with you, you lived with John for a while, right? Yeah, uh, me and John, um, we met around the same time that Exemption put out our last record. Um, we were playing in a band called Rice Cultivation Society and he was playing drums. And soon after um, I joined that band, uh, I ended up moving into a house with him, which was known as Centerville locally, where we, we used to do shows and stuff. It was our buddy's home. Um, and yeah, we moved in together and then Moontooth started around that same time. So, you know, we had a very, you know, we, we had, had a very strong connection from, you know, he was playing drums in that band, but still it's like, you know, the chemistry of, of kind of just knowing you know, how somebody else works, uh, on their instrument and being able to communicate with them, like you said. And, uh, yeah, he had given me, um, an EP he made by himself. It was called Sun Abernock at the time. Uh, it's like his solo material. Um, and I didn't even know he could sing and he was playing everything on it. And it was just like, um, it was very beautiful music and his, like his voice and he had all these harmonies layered on it. And I was like, I didn't even know you could sing, let alone this well. And so, um, when exemption disbanded, uh, he was like the obvious choice and he, and he felt that way too. You know, he was pretty much the first person to reach and probably one of the only people really to reach out to me to say like, I should sing for you and Ray's new thing, whatever it is. I'm, I'm not completely convinced from that story that you guys didn't just create him in a lab somewhere <laughs> because like the vocals that that guy has, I mean, wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's, <laughs> there's no creating John in a lab. He is very much himself and he's, uh, 
you know, he, what you hear, you know, he's, he very much wears his heart on his sleeve artistically and, uh, you know, and personally too, you know, he, 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 his vocals and his lyrics are very much an extension of who he is. There's no, like, uh, there's no separation in that. And I feel like that you can hear that, especially on the, on the, on the last record crux. And uh, we got to talk about Crux for a second. I mean, how you guys uh, got in touch with Machine and then Machine got you in touch with Mark Morton. And uh, I think some people think, oh, well, they brought in these like outside people. And now they're going to start writing music as to what they're told to do. But when I listen to the album, I'm like, no, this is Moontooth, 100% Moontooth. But you guys had the maturity as artists to bring in an outside voice. That's really cool. Yeah, I mean, um, that all happened very um, organically. Like, uh, we were on tour with Fit for an Autopsy, uh, and they are obviously, you know, that's Will Putney is, is the brain behind them, and, and, and Will, at, I don't know the story of that well, to be honest, but he worked under Machine at some point. As, um, oh, okay. And, you know, basically one day, Pat from Fit was like, hey, uh, I just got a text that producer machine wants to talk to you guys and he's going to come to the knitting factory show to meet you, which was the last show on that tour. Um, and you know, machine especially was like a name that me and Ray, you know, Ray's more like versed in, um, this producer and that producer and this engineer and that engineer, cause that's his job. But we both knew machine cause of ashes of the wake by Lamb of God and, and blast tyrant by clutch specifically. Those records were, um, hugely influential on us growing up. You know, they were, you know, I, at one point I could say that we probably learned like 75% of that Lamb of God record and we're just jamming on it all the time, you know? So, um, for us, it was like, well, this is a person that's directly, you know, we're directly influenced by, and if he's coming, you know, if he's heard our, our music and is interested in us, then that's like a call that we should answer, you know, at least to meet him. And uh, he came to a couple shows and, and we got along really well. And we started kind of putting the wheels in motion to work together. Uh, but at the time we, we had no label um, and, you know, how we were going to get him paid and all, you know, all the, um, all the real details of uh, how we were going to make this happen were still kind of up in the air and confusing. So, you know, he, he was the one to say like, hey, like I've been talking to Mark Morton from, from Lamb about uh working together on some production stuff like what would you feel about doing pre-pro at his house and um having him sort of involved in the process while we do pre-pro and of course it was again it was like you know would we have ever thought to like we should reach out to mark from lamb of god and see if he'd want to work on our record like of course not but it wasn't something that we like any of us wanted to say no to i mean that being said we you know we were intimidated by it you know we didn't really we had been approached by a producer or two before that basically wanted to come in and like basically kind of take over. And we were very much like against that you know, and uh, wary of people that want to kind of come into what we do and, and mess with it. But uh, this one just seemed like too good of an opportunity to, to pass up obviously. So we were really stoked and um, we learned a lot from it. You know, we learned a lot about what it's like to do that and, um, you know, just like our, who we are as songwriters and, and it just really kind of, uh, taught us a lot of good lessons that we're still, you know, uh, learning from. And I feel like, um, it just made us a stronger band. You know, I, I was really into the, obviously I was really stoked to work with Machine and Mark, but it was really about like, I know that this will make us a better band, even if it's like a total train wreck disaster <laughs> for whatever reason, I know that this will be a good experience for us to go through. You know, it'll, it'll, it'll force us to grow and it'll put the pressure on to like force us to, um, to push ourselves and to be better, you know, that you won't, you don't have that same, uh, scary pressure when you're just recording a record at your house, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I think it was a wise choice. I mean, obviously the record has been received really well. <laughs> yeah, man. And uh, it was, and it wasn't like they ever were like, here, give me the guitar, you know, or, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, like, why don't you sing about this? Or maybe you just change your melody to this. You know, it was just a lot of shooting ideas. I mean, it was a lot of, you know, it, it took a little while for us to be able to accept any outside ideas. But it was also really, um, 
awesome to have Mark there because Mark had went through it with Machine, and they were bringing up old stories of like when they did Ashes of the Wake, they wouldn't take like a lick of like advice from him. And it wasn't until the following record that they were like, all right, we, we kind of want to listen to your ideas. Because it's like, you know, your band is your baby, and he could relate to that. You know, your songs are your baby, your babies, and like you don't want really people to, to mess with them because you feel like that takes them away from you. But like, you know, as long as you're a part of the decision-making process and you're happy with the with what you're working on, then, you know, it's it was still, it still felt like ours at the end of the day. And, you know, long story short, we didn't... Um, you know, we ended up recording and, and Ray mixed and mastered it all himself um, because of the uh, logistics of everything just wasn't working out, you know, and, and it wasn't until after we our, our friends at Modern Static put the record out that, that Pure Noise Records and, and management came along. Like, we sort of realized that, like, nobody's going to believe in this um, until we prove it ourselves. You know, we're going to put this out with our friends and we're going to prove that it has the strength. Um, um, our friend Munzee who helped us with our radio campaign, he would call me and he's like, this fucking record's got legs. And that, that's, that's like kind of the meaning, like it's, it's got legs, like it's running on its own. And you know, like people want it you know, without me having to like force it down their throats. And once we kind of proved it organically is, it was when, you know, everything, you know, the label came and the management came and, uh, you know, Animals as Leaders tour, whatever, you know, things just started to, because like for a couple of years leading up to that record, we were like going through hell trying to get it out and figure out what we were going to do. And, you know, it was definitely like a low point. Um, so it was nice to be on the other side of that finally and to have proven it. And, and, you know, we definitely owe a large gratitude to Mark and Machine for being like, you know, a few of the first people to really see the potential in the band and believe in us. And now Violent Grief, Acoustic Selections. I mean, like we were just talking about at the beginning that you're uh, influenced by bluesgrass players. We were talking about Chet Atkins. So doing Acoustic Selections, uh, was this something that you've always kind of wanted to do? Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, the person that wanted to do this the most was definitely John. Uh, you know, it's like he's he had to spend so many years playing in like shot clubs, like with terrible PAs and trying to get over me and Vin's like stacks and Ray slamming the drums and, you know, and he has such a great voice, but he had to struggle with, you know, trying to be heard for so many years. And so it was always like, I'd love to do an acoustic thing just so like, you know, like we can, not only can he shine as a singer, but we can all shine and just show that like, this is not just metal, you know, this, there's, there are real songs here that um, can translate. Um, so it's been talked about for a long time. Uh, and it was just sort of something that, we kind of talked about and we would just do tours and this, that, and the other thing we we're too busy to do. And then when we met with, with Pure Noise for the first time, you know, they were like, what can we do to put something out to extend this, this crux cycle and promote this tour you guys are going on? So like the obvious answer was the acoustic EP. Um, and so, you know, and, and we wanted to include at least one new song on there. So the, uh, the idea for it came together very quickly um, and then we started recording it and then, uh, COVID happened. And so that, you know, the tour got canned and the recording of it got delayed a bit. Um, you know, we, we took some time off and then started to get together only one-on-one -on -one and being safe about it and distant about it. And, um, you know, so it took a little bit longer to get it together in the actual recording of it. Um, and, uh, it was funny, like, I really thought that, oh, yeah, cool, acoustic EP, we'll just bang this thing out. But then even besides uh, COVID, it was it was very tricky to translate some of the stuff to acoustic. Um, you know, it didn't take long to get the ideas for what it would be, but to actually play it perfectly every time and make it, you know, really pop on an acoustic guitar. You know, I, I realized, like, all right, like, I really should move this chord down here or, you know, I, I have to move all these things down an octave or, like, some songs we changed keys altogether, so... Um, it was more involved than I had expected initially. And all those things are satisfying, aren't they? To know that you've, you've written music that is versatile enough and that you're also versatile enough as musicians to translate it into a new style without losing the moon tooth essence. Yeah, for sure. I mean, n none of us um, really set out to be like a, a quote unquote prog metal band you know we really just have a lot of influences and, and just 
want to make, you know, we just sort of kind of think of us as just a rock and roll band or a hard rock band or something, you know, like it's not, we want to, we're never going to not want the pyrotechnics on the instruments, you know, it, we're, that's part of who we are and what we like to do to push ourselves. But, you know, writing good songs has always been, um, you know, priority number one. Um, and also not ever holding ourselves back. Like, oh, we can't have a, we can't have a, you know, finger picked clean song or we can't have, um, you know, a straight up like death metal part in a song. Like it doesn't, you know, we never would choose to limit ourselves like that. Um, but yeah, the acoustic thing ended up being very, um, gratifying in a way I wasn't expecting it. I thought it would be fun. And then now that I listen to it, it's like, I'm very proud of it. And, uh, I think it, yeah, it's like a cool, it's a cool little moment in our like career repertoire so far where, you know, that stands out from the rest of it. Um, cause we, you know, you could hear on crux that we have, um, you know, like clean, like things that can obviously translate to acoustic guitar, but it's still presented in the context of like a loud rock band. So, um, and I'm really just happy that people can really hear John shine as a singer, you know, cause he can, it really, uh, puts a nice spotlight on him looking forward have you started working on any new material for the next album uh yeah we have um we have a lot of material um you know Yay. yeah um we're, we're really in the process now of trying to trying to figure out like what's the best of it um because we have enough for probably close to three records at this point but not all of it is um you know not all of it is like as developed as as other songs so um, we're really just trying to now kind of go through it all and sort of prioritize like what seems to be, um, the strongest stuff and also like what's going to make sense. Like we're trying to kind of mold the face of the next record because it's definitely not going to be, you know, crux part two by any means. There's a, there's a new kind of, there's always going to be like new moods and new experimentation with our playing and stuff like that. That's kind of bringing new moods. So we're starting to kind of see what it looks like and what the themes are and everything like that. Um, but yeah, a lot of, a lot of new material. We've been kind of splitting time in the last month or two between the getting the acoustic stuff ready to like perform in some capacity when we can, when we can do that. And, um, uh, we have, you know, we're working on a, a plan for a live performance and we'll, we'll, we'll have an announcement for that soon. Um, it'll be, you know, virtual. It's not going to be in person yet, obviously, but, um, details for that will come out pretty soon. And then, uh, but yeah, we've been splitting time. So once we kind of figure out, once the acoustic thing comes out and we figure that out, we can just focus fully on the next record, you know, because we've all been stuck in our houses. So I've been spending a lot of time demoing just by myself and getting ideas together. Luckily I've been very inspired to write. Um, I don't know, you know, usually like the worst, the, the worst, life is or like the world is around me the the more material <laughs> comes out of the guitar so there's been plenty of uh material lately i think that's because uh we need it <laughs> we need it at times like these yeah uh, i i need it too you know the band needs it too uh but aside from music i mean music can't be the only thing in your life what are your other hobbies things that you like to do Oh man, um, I um, may kind of made the mistake of making my hobby my my focus in life. <laughs> Everybody um, answers that question that way. <laughs> I, I, I I love movies. Um, I love just uh, I just got engaged. I'm, I'm congratulations. Thank you. You know I love just spending time with my fiance and watching you movies. Uh, I don't know. Do I together? have? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, yeah her. Uh, passion life is teaching yoga her company diana yoga does a lot of really cool things even virtually now so she's influenced me to to uh to do that i i've often played music for the classes and just do live guitar stuff to accompany um but but that's definitely luckily for me become a you know part of my life as well um yeah i don't know I'm, i've been working on you know the hobbies thing i gotta i gotta figure out more <laughs> hobbies uh, something to distract from from guitar but you know i still just love to play guitar i mean it's it's it drives me up the fucking wall sometimes you know trying to get things where that you know sometimes it's not really relaxing but it's you know i'm still very um i just feel like i still have a lot of 
work to do and a lot of material that I, you know, I haven't dug out of it yet. You know, I, I definitely don't feel like burnt on it by any means. I still look forward to, you know, I teach guitar for a living. So I, I end up with a guitar in my lap, like pretty much all day, every day. Um, but that's not the same as being creative. And, you know, I look forward to the times where I have like, you know, just a few hours just to kind of just play, you know, that's really what I look forward to most. What advice would you give to anybody who's trying to pursue their dreams? Uh, the obvious one is just to, to not give up. I mean, that's like, it goes without saying. Um, but I think that, um, just be willing to deal with the worst possible scenario <laughs> and, and be willing to like, I hate this sounds very negative and I really mean it in a positive way. Expect the worst and lower expectations so that you're just happy to do it. You know, especially in the, if you're, I mean, your passion could be anything, but if it's in the arts, you know, it's like you're going to get chewed up and spit out a lot and you're going to be really angry and dis disappointed and disenfranchised by, you know, that industry. And, and it's important to stay in touch with why you wanted to do it in the first place. You know, like why, you know, when I get like upset about a missed opportunity, whatever it is, a tour or anything like that, I have to just remember that like, I, you know, I didn't want to do this for something I can put on paper to say, look what I did. You know, I, I did it because, you know, it spoke to me and it was my immediate gravitation towards it that that's all I needed to know is, is that like, this is a part of my identity and it's not about measuring a success in like numbers or achievements. It's about measuring success and, and, you know, you being able to look back on a lifetime of not giving up on what you care about and, and, you know, and the, the art that you create. I mean, like you said before, like this world more than ever needs, you know, art to, to not only like the word escape, but like something to kind of just show that human beings are, are, <laughs> are worth, you know, <laughs> they're like destroying of the earth otherwise, you know, and this, you know, it's like they, they, you need to, we need to have something to look back on and, and enjoy that and years to come and, and to learn from and, and to reflect, you know, it's also to reflect on what we live through. Um, I'm sorry, it's a bit of a rambling answer there, but, uh, you know, I, I really think that just to, being a, being willing to like imagine yourself in the worst possible scenario that could happen in your career and be okay with it. Is there anything else you want to let our listeners know? Um, just, you know, please pick up uh, Violent Grief, you know, on July 31st, um, the vinyl and the, that came out really really beautiful and um you know and if not just just listen to it and and you know tell, let us know what you think share it with a friend you know i think that it's going to be a nice summer soundtrack and uh you know just um you know when we can come out and play live just just come out because we're definitely a live band at heart so you know we're, we're definitely itching to get back out there Everybody, you've been listening to The Peach Pit. I've been here talking with Nick Lee from Moontooth. Their EP, Violent Grief Acoustic Selections, comes out July 31st. But you can pre-order it now, which you might as well do, because then you can make sure that you're going to get it. Nick, thank you for taking time to talk to me, and uh, hopefully we can do this again in the future. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Derek. Take care of yourself. All right, you too. See ya.